How's it going? I'm Andrew with Investors Hub, and it's Clems Day Wednesday on Thursday again because I got backlogged. And we're going to be talking to him about his favorite topic, and that's cryptocurrency. And uh, so if you guys don't know who Clem Chambers is, he is the CEO of ADVFN. He's my boss, and he knows a ton about crypto, about investing, and tons and tons of different topics. And to give you guys some context for this interview, last week there was the big crypto crash, and we talked to him last week as well. And it was his general opinion that you shouldn't blame the yodelers, you should pay attention to how much snow is on the mountain. And he felt like there was a crypto crash coming and it was only a matter of time. And something eventually was going to knock all that snow off the mountain. And uh, it was a variety of different things. Elon Musk's tweets, it was China being upset about Bitcoin. And so this interview, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the yodelers in particular, right? On how celebrity investors can influence cryptocurrency and how cryptocurrency is in such a tenuous relationship with so many governments that are around. And uh, yeah, so I get his input on those topics. And if you like the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to share it with somebody that uh, needs to learn a little bit more about cryptocurrency. And let's hear from Clem. Please note that our videos are not designed to be direct investing advice. We're here to gather the perspective of different investors. Our channel and our content should just be one stop on the journey of trying to find out where to put your money. So Clem, how long do you think that it's going to be that cryptocurrency is sort of unduly influenced by celebrity investors? Like when can it start standing on its own two feet? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of what's powered uh, the market in crypto and also in, in, in stocks has been this new generation of, I mean, people use the word millennials, but I just see it as being the next generation on from the dot-com crash. Because when that crash happened, a whole generation of investors were wiped out. And, you know, they went, oh, I lost a ton of money. Oh, I'm not, I'm not doing this game anymore. And it takes 20 years for the next generation to come along that have no idea about what's gone before. And here it is. Yeah. And those celebs, well, they're heavily influenced by them because that's the world that they come from or the world that they live in. It's the digital natives and it's the social media people. You know, it, it, that's all they know. So that's something that's very embedded in the way that they think. And they're novice. So, you know, they're they're very social. And they follow the herd. And, you know, like um, any any herd ends up getting shorn. So it's not just um, in crypto with Musk and, and other influencers. It's also in equities, you know, the, the Wall Street bets guys on Reddit, the stonks only go up stuff, which is, um, you know, a lot of fun. And some of them have made really good money and some of them will get to keep it. And some of them won't be wiped out whenever the market decides or the government decides not to support the market anymore. I think a lot of them have already been wiped out. And, um, you know, ultimately, if you follow the herd, as I said earlier, you know, you will hope it's not a lemmings that you are part of because you're off a cliff, aren't you? But, you know, following the herd it never tends to be a good strategy, uh, particularly not for the, for the novice. And let's face it, a large amount of the market action we've been seeing is novices. So at some point when the Fed stops supporting stocks with QE to infinity and there's a big correction like there's going on in crypto, then you know we'll lose a large proportion of that generation of new investors. And then it'll be back to the old, miserable, grumpy people like me who will be grinding away at it. And there'll be a new generation of young people who will be the 10% left behind who will grind away at it. And then we'll have to wait another 20 years for the next generation to come along. And sadly, that's how this stuff works. I mean, if only um, Wall Street or the financial system would actually um, nurture these people or be, be benign to these um, uh, new generation of investors or uh, traders, then there would be a lot more longevity, be a lot more sustainable. But if you actually talk to these uh, people, and it's always the same every every four or five years, you know, you will get to talk to people that are new to the game. They just won't listen. They absolutely won't listen. They just come in and, and they know it all and, and, you know, walk straight into the machine gun fire. And that's their lot. And it's a, a tried and tested um, cycle. And the industry itself has given up or maybe never, did, never, never tried. But, you know, these people won't 
um, be told and go in and blow their money. So the actual industry kind of optimizes towards that reality. And you see that in Europe with um, the spread betting companies, the CFDs companies, and you see that in the options market. Uh, the, the people that provide the services to that audience know full well, have given up caring, and they know full well that they are, are, are short life expectancy traders. They will not be around in six or nine months. So you might as well, you know, take advantage of their naivety and wave goodbye when they lose all the money. And um, that's very sad. But, you know, we try, don't we? And we try Investors Hub. We try ADVFN to give people the tools to give them the opportunity to um, skill up the opportunity to see what's really going on for example in the order book blah 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 but as you know everybody wants to talk you know uh, I, I can't use the phrase talk <clears throat> um, rather than actually learn like microstructure and the way that all this stuff works it's entertainment unfortunately for a lot of people and it's an expensive old entertainment but, you know, a lot of people have um, been prepared to pay for that. And um, that's what the market tends to cater for. So recently, the, the Chinese have reaffirmed that their financial institutions are not supposed to be messing with crypto. And an overwhelming majority of Bitcoin mining, for example, happens in China. So do you think that there's going to be more constrictions coming from China on that crypto market? And if China somehow finds a way to totally crack down on crypto, uh, what do you think uh, that will do to, say, Bitcoin? So in China, you just can't take your money and send it abroad. Although a large proportion of, of well-off Chinese um, try to do that all the time. And, you know, there's well tried and tested methods of, you know, egressing your capital. Um, and, you know, it's a big old industry, but nothing beats Bitcoin. Because you've got Bitcoin in your wallet now. Well, it's gone in there. It's in America it's five seconds later. And, you know, your family member can pull it out and put it in Coinbase and cash it out and money gone. Right. So the whole infrastructure in China of making new Bitcoin. I mean, obviously, they sell a lot to everybody that isn't in China. But anybody that wants to buy it in China, once you've got your yuan into Bitcoin, it's gone. And. You know, when it's a small issue, they're not going to bother with it. Maybe a lot of people there within their actual system itself quite like Bitcoin to be around because it's not um, famously, um, you know, uh, North European in attitudes towards money and, and graft and all that sort of stuff, which obviously Bitcoin is quite famous for being something that's good for. But I think China as a system of government anyway, the Chinese Communist Party or, or whatever sector worries about these things, when, you know, Holy cow, or WTF, because Bitcoin exploded. And then obviously it comes up above, the, you stick your head above the parapet, you're going to get it shot off. So as Bitcoin exploded and became a you know mainstream asset, not quite mainstream, but you know, a significant asset, they felt that it was large enough to do something about it. So you can imagine the ability to put your 100 billion zillion liras into a Bitcoin. And that Bitcoin to appear in America like that and for your daughter or son to um, put it in their Coinbase account and then, you know, buy a house with it in Seattle is extremely attractive. And when that uh, instrument reaches a certain scale, well, you've got to move against it. Otherwise, all your capital is going to be draining out of your country. The thing about crypto, and nobody talks about this, but it's really, really important. If you look at um, the Internet, it's computers plus communication. If you look at um, uh, DOS and Windows and Apple, it's computers plus productivity and so on and so forth. Well, what crypto is, is computers plus politics. That's a pretty, pretty heady mix, isn't it? So, you know, crypto has vast power because at some stage it's going to go very, very overtly blockchain and politics. And those countries are going to be incredibly efficient, right? Because we all know that that um, governments are really inefficient, right? I mean, even the efficient ones are inefficient. I mean, governments are generally rubbish at doing whatever they do because of the way that they're structured. They're, they're a monopoly. And as we all know, monopolies are not very good. In fact, you know, that they're a monopoly controlling monopolies half the time. But the blockchain has the ability to crack that all open. 
and it will because it will be more efficient and anything that's more efficient will will succeed over the less efficient so it there's there's an arrow of destiny here with crypto and blockchain that that bitcoin was just the beginning of bitcoin is money right and and governments and political systems are built on money and that's what's going to come and of course if you say no no we'll have none of that well you know you're going to stay in in a economic and technological era that we're living in now not the one of the future and like any country that falls behind you know you're going to become a backwater aren't you so that's the underlying driver of the whole thing is is unstoppable and there will be peaks and troughs and governments will say we ban it and then three years later they'll have to unban it when you move into things like um daos distributed authorities you know one man one coin one vote and all the possible other permutations of, of doing that voting on the blockchain passing laws on the blockchain enforcing contracts on the blockchain and on and on and on well you know that is a panacea and if you turn away from that you're going to fall back into you know, I guess we're not going to fall back into the dark ages because we've left that already but it's going to be very 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 bad for any economy any society that doesn't embrace that technology because they're just going to be way way less efficient than everybody else so th that's inescapable and so you know like all things crypto it goes up like a rocket down like a rock and then it recovers and goes up like a rocket and down like a rock and that's going to be the future of crypto well in my lifetime anyway do you have time for one more question Clem sure sure so how so hash mining power in a proof of work system is a, a measure of the raw computing power that's being poured into the network in order to validate blocks how does hash mining power correlate to the price of the coin so does hash mining power go up because the price of the coin is going up and interest in the chain is going up or if we see a situation where, like for example, China, they manage to crack down on mining in China and we see a sudden drop in hash mining, will we also see a drop in coin price? There is, there is a link and, and there appears to be, has appeared to be a very strong one in Ethereum. If the price goes up, then um, the amount of, it's worth your while to mine and it's worth your while to buy more miners. And then when you do that and everybody does that, you need more mining to get the same result, but it balances itself out. So if you if you unplug half of the mining machines, the blockchain will run at half the speed. And after what well, it could be four weeks in that case, it will then retarget down. So you don't need so much hash. So if China unplugged all its miners, um, the actual blockchain would would slow down a lot, maybe to a third of its current speed. And then just because the it, the the machines have vanished, okay, um, but after it would take three times as long to retarget. So it takes six weeks. And then at the six weeks moment, it would retarget down to the one block every 10 minutes that, that is the um, is the rule system, the politics of, of the Bitcoin. And then um, that hash would be enough. And whether people wanted less of it or more of it is, is not necessarily relevant. If Bitcoin was unpopular and the price collapses, then a lot of people would look at it and go, oh, Oh, I'm losing money making bitcoins, and some of them will go. Well, I don't care. I'll, I'll, get, I'll take the bitcoins. I won't sell them. Uh, Bitcoin in the pocket today is is going to be worth five times as much in the future. We've, we've got the money. We'll just keep running the machines. Yeah, and uh, but people would fall away, and then it would get easy to easier to mine, and therefore the mining machines are making more money, even though the price has gone down. And it's a self-adjusting system. That's the whole point, and it's been proven time and time again to work. And of course. If no one wants to do transactions, it doesn't matter whether it only the blocks only go once every hour. Because then, you, you see, if you're only going once every hour and I want to send you 100 grand, yeah, it's going to take forever to get to you. But I go in and I, I, I say, well, I'll, I'll pay the miners $90 to send that, or $150 or $200. And the miner will go, well, I, I can afford to get my machine out now and plug it into my um, windmill or whatever he's doing, you know. So it's all self-adjusting. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's all self-adjusting. The other thing that goes on, of course, is that you're mining away with this machine you bought last year and it will make a Bitcoin every month or whatever it is. Wouldn't you like a machine that runs 10 times faster? And you can buy it at the price that you bought the one that runs at 10% of that speed two years ago. Well, it's coming out next May. 
So, you know, you ring up someone in China or who knows where, mainly China, and you say, give me one of them machines. And they say, send me the money now. You'll get it in four months. And you go, oh, oh who are you? And um, generally speaking, the machines show up. I mean, you know, it's trying to buy some mining um, A6 is a pretty hair raising experience because they just basically say, yeah, sure. Four months. Send, send all the money now to China, please. And you pay Bitcoin and then we we'll send them to you. We will. Yes, promise. So it's, it's a pretty spicy zone. But some clever bunch of fellas comes out with this machine that's four times faster, uses the same amount of energy. And of course, everyone has to have it then because your machine is, is um, efficiency just gone. Or rather, all of a sudden, there's three times as much um, uh, hash power going on, chasing the same amount of bitcoins. And your machine is some little Mickey Mouse thing that, that, that was powerful four years ago and now uses, you know, $60,000 of energy to get one Bitcoin out, which is no good at all. So the, the value of the mining machines goes down and down and down and down and down. And I, I, I you know, I keep looking at it and I, it goes, well, you know, to get my money back on the machine is going to take me about a year, by which time it's going to be, you know, rubbish in comparison with the new machines. How's that work? Well, you do need the price to do that to make it work. So that's not a business that we're um, attracted by, but that's the business that people are in. And um, the ASICs is a very, very interesting um, area. It's driving the whole, well, it's driving a very large proportion of, of the silicon market because, you know, the Bitcoin miners and the mining machine makers, they're all super, super, supersonic nerd people. And they, you know, if you get a machine that runs 10 times faster, you make a ton of money. So they're all going, hey, chip company, foundry, do this, do that, do this. So the, the proof of work structure actually is, is driving a, a lot of, of silicon development. And, and that's really good um, news for everybody. And it's also connecting into AI because the sort of machines that, that A, the ASICs, the special silicon chips that only do one little thing, which is go make a hash, make a hash, make a hash. It's very similar technology to AI technology that does whatever AI does, which is, I don't know, make an average, make an average, make an average, and um, tensors. So people like Bitmain, you know, they're saying, hey, we're, we're an AI company too. We'll say yeah, AI kit, yeah, we do, we do um, crypto, all that stuff, but hey, we, we can be AI too. And so that's also interesting, because obviously AI, that's a massive potential revolution um, you know, if you don't mind driving to a tree in your car, AI is the future. And, you know, AI is a, is a big deal. And AI will be, you know, one of those um, stock market bubbles in, in a few years time for sure. So crypto, AI, there's a few of these um, big uh, disruptors on the way. And the hash power dynamic is, is all part of that. Uh, and it's very, very closely connected from a te technological um, standpoint with uh, machines that do AI. Hey, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, like, comment, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, I have underscore vision, and I'll see you again soon.